So I think we have time for questions. Oh, a lot. A ten okay. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Someone can, who, see, who believes to recognize a question can look back mm -hmm. at the question or not. Yeah. So uh, the or, or, earlier studies, the ones that I, uh, the earlier, the classic studies on these these types of studies have um, typically been done paper and pencil. In our replication attempts, we haven't systematically varied those, but we have done them in, in different ways. Both in terms of sometimes using paper and pencil, sometimes using computer administered questionnaires, and then also within the computer administered questionnaire, sometimes we allow people to go back and sometimes we don't. We haven't noticed a systematic difference in this, but we haven't explicitly tested that. But yes, all the earlier ones did involve paper and pencil. Would you mind really, um, introducing yourself as well? Uh, hello, my name is Jürgen Lauer from the University of London. And I have one question. I mean, you put this a little bit as if there is a competition between these type of measures, but then um, my understanding of this literature was always that these are just complementary measures of different things. And I guess there are these examples of like childcare, which is perceived uh, emotionally as often distressing and stressful, but of course there's some kind of life satisfaction component. Similarly, work, which is often perceived as not particularly enjoyable activity, but then gives you a career and so on. Could you maybe say a word about like should we really see these as competing measures, or is, does it not make sense to ask for both of them and treat them separately in the analysis? Yeah, I think that that's, that's a really good point. I did definitely present them as competing. I think that part of I think that you're right. If you read most papers uh, that look at these types of things, look at these types of measures, they present them as complementary. Um, but that's often an afterthought in the, the, the discussion section. And I think a lot of times they are presented as if. Um, uh, I think that, and I think that there are some. Um, uh, I think that there are occasions where people, because of the obvious benefits of the experiential measures, even if they say we should study both, there is a push towards the experiential measures being something that actually reflects the truth of these things. Uh, so I think, for instance, one uh, one, uh, one famous example is that you might have heard the study that uh, after fifty-seven thousand uh, dollars, income doesn't make any difference for your for your well-being. Uh, so that's the headline story. That headline came from a one, ex one item uh, experiential measure. And in that same study, same paper, uh, the actual research with the life satisfaction measure actually showed that it kept continuing up. And so even in that one, where in the same paper you have the two different measures, the one that reflects really what's going on, and the one that gets in the headline is the one that's based on the experiential measure. So I still do think that there's a bias towards accepting what comes from the experiential measure as being a little bit closer to the truth. Even if I think that there's a lot of hand waving at the fact that both are, both are valid and both uh, have some uh, some complementarity, so uh, I think that there are a lot of people that I think that are, do take a very nuanced view on this. So I think that that's good. I believe that we should both be studying both of these, but I still think that there is a little bit of a bias in the literature towards focusing on the experiential measures that I don't think is yet deserved. Um, yeah, Richard, thank you very much for that. Um, I wanted to ask you about the underlying presumption that you seem to have, which is that what we're really after is, as it were, some kind of aggregate of lifetime instantaneous feelings, some notion of instantaneous utility, and that one can either get at that by these sort of experience sampling methods or by some of the evaluations in which people themselves put weight on it. Is that how you see it? I think that, uh, and not necessarily. So I think that people could evaluate their life from a very a variety of different perspectives. And so I would I think that actually uh, you could come up with that judgment if that judgment was meaningful for some other reason. So if that judgment predicted useful outcomes, even if it doesn't didn't actually correspond to this lifetime of moments, I think it would still be useful in that way. I think it's a useful starting point to assume that it does reflect something about the aggregation of these moments. Um, I am open to being convinced that that's not what it is. I'm open to being convinced that it's not uh, um, uh, useful as well. Um, I think it could be useful whether it does or does not capture that aggregation of moments. But could you also assume people are like that? They have such moments. 
They do, yes. There yes. is such an <laughs> instantaneous utility in that. Yes. There's also a question, though, about whether the experiential, me experiential measures accurately <laughs> capture that as well. Or, or that it even exists. Yeah. Yes. That is what humans are like. Yeah, no, I think yes, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Who's that from the uh, from Vienna? So you my question hold the microphone differently. My question concerns the statistical distribution of the levels of satisfaction. In one of your earlier slides, uh, you showed a small sample where the distribution seems to be left skewed. So you have a gradual increase, then you have a turning point, then you have a maximum and a steep decrease. Why is this left skewed? Have you some idea why it's not right skewed, for instance? If this would be right skewed, this would be something like a power law, which is quite common in sociology. Yeah, I mean, what I will say is actually the, the distribution that I showed you was, was actually not from one of those small sample studies. That was from a very large sample of, of national representative data in the U.S. that I was using to compare to that. I will also say that that distribution is extremely consistent, at least in Western nations. We typically find that skew. We find that distribution uh, really, really consistently. Um, I'm not sure exactly why it, why it exists. I think that pointing out that fact was something that people focused on for a while. I think that we now all accept that it does exist, at least when these self-reported measures are used. Um, I think that we get that also when we actually assess people's momentary uh, So even if you just ask people on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, uh, uh, just dichotomously, is this a pleasant moment or an unpleasant moment, uh, you get this really strong skew where most of the time people are uh, slightly pleasant uh, in their in the moments. And so um, I'm not sure exactly why it is the case, but it is very, very robust uh, across different types of methods of assessment, across different types of uh, studies that we use. Well, thank you. Later this morning, we're going to have a, a presentation by Anastasia Liadi about the fundamental difference between happiness and life satisfaction. You seem to use them all over the place interchangeably. Don't you see a, a real difference, or if so, what is the difference? Yeah, no, that's a good question, and I did try to get it at the beginning. I think that sometimes the happiness thing seems to capture what uh, a broader range of people uh, are, are uh, mean by global well-being. Uh, so sometimes I do use that interchangeably. Absolutely, in my papers, I try to be very much more precise and use life satisfaction, which I think is probably um, the closest thing that we would get to what I typically mean by global measures subjective well-being. Um, I think that there is a question, so I think that there's definitely a precise way that we can use the word happiness that I think that it does differ from life satisfaction. Um, and then there is a question, I think, about how people use happiness more broadly. And I think that that does vary across languages, uh, across different types of groups. So yes, when I, when I try to be precise, I try to focus more on life satisfaction and do acknowledge that if we are measuring something like happiness, it often comes up very different, not very differently, but it comes up differently than uh, life satisfaction. So yes, I think that, that, that that's absolutely true. Uh, I think there's one here. So oh, okay. Yeah. In groups, or I just take one and then one more and then I do the other groups. Okay, thank you very much. And my question is a little bit extension of this question because in the literature, the conceptualization of subject of learning and the, the proper measures of the subject of learning uh, it's a little bit normative. It depends on the field uh, or the background you study. If you are a political scientist or sociologist, you much prefer to use the life satisfaction as a measure of subjective well-being. And if you're from like psychology background or the other studies background, you prefer to use the happiness measures. And when you look at uh, literatures, like especially the, the philosophical, the Sumner study from uh, the philosophical conceptualization of subjective well-being, uh, there is a diffusion, confusion in the literature. So I think it really affects the, the measurement of the subjective well-being, this theoretical and conceptualization uh, uh, differences, or the problem still continues, I think, in the field. And this using interchangeably is still a big question mark. And so that's why I think, um, what we should think about, like especially the, the, the theoretical developments of the, the social theory, like more relational approach to, to define the subject of well-being might be a maybe way to open to uh, this theoretical and measurement problem. What would you... Uh, well, I take quickly another question and then... Answer both of them? Yeah. Okay, sure. 
I'll, I'll try to remember it. Yeah. Hello, I'm Jason from Russell, Germany. So I have a question about the measurement. So my impression is that measurement usually depends on the whole range, like the abstraction measurement as a scale from zero, 1 to 8 or? 0 to 10 usually, yeah, that, but it varies, yes. So I'm interested in inequality. Inequality measures usually is constrained by, for example, this one is, has a lower bound, upper bound. And you have, if you have a scale from 1 to 100, then the distribution might be different. I wonder in your field there have people try different measures. Yeah, so I'll, ask that one, I'll answer that one first because it's a little bit quicker. So people do change the response scales quite a bit. And I think that um, you get some differences, some subtle differences, but I think that uh, for the most part, uh, going from a 0 to 10 to a 1 to 100 does not change things very much. Sometimes people use sliders where there's actually not any sort of, um, you know, there might not even be a number, there'd be something like that. So as far as at least the distribution, a lot of the correlates, uh, a lot of the correlations won't change that much with uh, those types of things. As far as the, the bigger issue about what, what measure we're actually using, absolutely. And I think that the different fields should engage with one another. So we do talk to philosophers a lot about their views on these sorts of things. Um, part of it is I think that sometimes we don't start out with a definition, a clear definition about what we think that we mean. So some people think that these are supposed to capture everything about well-being. I don't. I try to be very careful at the beginning to focus on subjective well-being and what I mean by subjective well-being. Uh, I think we can be a little bit more precise about those definitions, but absolutely we should be talking across fields about how to do that. Um, thank you All so right, thank much. Thank you so much. So you would say